I think unlike the previous speaker, this was my first ever visit to, uh, to Rutgers and to the Dimax workshops. I'm excited to be here. Uh, in this talk, I will focus on enabling uh, privacy-preserving analytics uh, with a specific uh, uh, focus on, on data that has interesting structural and, and temporal correlation. And I will put forward the thesis that it's important to, uh, to understand the correlation in, in data, uh, to understand the evolution of data, uh, use it in the design of uh, privacy-preserving mechanisms, and also use it uh, uh, for understanding the privacy of our mechanisms as well. Uh, so just a very, very quick uh, uh, introduction, though I think this, this community doesn't really, uh, really need it. I think the, the focus of this workshop is, is, uh, is, is nicely motivated by, by the availability of large-scale uh, large scale data sets. As a society, we're generating uh, exabytes of data every day, uh, and, and most of the data that we have created in the world has been created in the last, uh, last two years. Uh, and this, this, ri this rise of big data sets has, uh, has, has led to uh, the possibility of many exciting applications. Uh, bioinformatics and, and medical researchers would love to have access to uh, high throughput uh, genomic data for, for applications like cancer genomics. Uh, exciting Internet of Things uh, applications are, are possible with, uh, uh, with large-scale uh, data sets about users. And similarly, many exciting social applications are possible uh, with large-scale Internet data sets. Uh, however, data is sensitive, and, uh, and, and the functionality of many of these applications is in, is in direct conflict with, with, the need to protect, uh, with the need to protect privacy of data. So as we've seen in many, uh, many previous talks, one of the key questions in this, in this domain is how do we balance uh, the utility of the data uh, with, uh, with the privacy protections that, uh, that, that users desire. Uh, so the key, the key slide in this talk is that uh, as, we, as we think about this question, it's important to think about correlations in data. Uh, Large-scale data sets exhibit interesting structural and temporal correlations. Uh, so for example, here's a visualization of, uh, of uh, uh, different uh, uh, web links on the internet. So each, each vertex uh, here corresponds to a particular IP address and connections between those IP address corresponds to, uh, correspond to web, web links on the internet. Uh, this is a representation of uh, uh, social connections on, on, on Facebook, just a sampled uh, fraction plotted on a coordinate system and we can see, uh, we can see the emergence of, uh, of continents. And similar correlations also exist in, in genomic data and, and, other, and other IoT other IoT applications. Uh, so the approach that I will talk about will model data uh, in, in the form of network data, so I'll talk about graphs, uh, and I will show the connection between uh, privacy-preserving analytics and the discipline of, of network science uh, that's aiming to study uh, properties of complex networks, including computer networks, uh, social networks, uh, genomic networks, and it's uh, building upon uh, foundational techniques in, in, in graph theory uh, inferential models, machine learning, and, and data mining. Uh, so the three uh, key takeaways from this talk are going to be uh, to, to reason about uh, the structural properties of data and how we can exploit them in the design of mechanisms, uh, then to think about the impact of uh, structural properties of data in terms of reasoning about privacy, and finally to go from thinking about structure of data to also think about the temporal dynamics and the evolution of of data. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at, at any time. Happy, happy to take questions. Uh, I'll first uh, jump on to uh, thinking about how do we exploit the structural properties of data for, for the design of privacy preserving mechanisms. And I will demonstrate this using a case study of, uh, of uh, social graph data. Uh, so social networks have of course uh, transformed our uh, communications in the, uh, in the last decade uh, with social links uh, presenting uh, an indication of shared interest amongst users as well as shared uh, trust amongst users. And uh, thus the social graph is, is a key enabler for many exciting applications, including systems for recommendation, systems for reputation, uh, historically systems that we haven't typically thought of as social systems, including systems like YouTube and, and Netflix and Yelp are now also aware of social links between users. Uh, so in fact, in the security community, we've used the social graph to design uh, interesting security applications such as systems for anonymous communication built, built on social, social connections, uh, systems for censorship resilient communications using, uh, using social connections. Uh, 
However, all of these applications uh, uh, face a critical deployment hurdle uh, that their functionality conflicts with the privacy requirements of users because they either explicitly reveal the social graph to an adversary or an adversary can exploit the protocol operations in these applications and use some traffic analysis attacks to infer the entire, uh, entire social graph. Uh, so in fact, all uh, prominent uh, uh, social networking uh, systems, including Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google+, have explicit permissions that allow users to, uh, to hide their social connections, and many users are explicitly taking advantage of, uh, of this functionality. So the question that uh, I'd like to address here is how do we balance this tension between uh, the need to make the social graph available uh, versus protecting the privacy of, uh, of links in the social graph. Uh, for experts in the audience, I want to point out that uh, uh, my focus in this talk is specifically in the context of link privacy and not in the context of vertex privacy. So uh, uh, many of the applications that I, uh, that I talked about in the previous, uh, previous slide rely on the identities of the users being known, uh, but we still want to protect uh, uh, their connections to, to each other. The perspective and the context that I'm taking for this talk is that of a social network operator. Uh, so think about Facebook, think about uh, Google+, think about Twitter, that already have access uh, to this large-scale social graph. And the key idea uh, is to add noise to the social graph to protect, protect user privacy. Uh, and, and what do I mean by adding noise to a social graph? The idea is to add some fake links to this graph and delete some, delete some real links. Uh, however, this process faces a key challenge, uh, which is to preserve the community structures in the social network. Because the uh, utility of many exciting applications is directly connected towards the need to protect these community structures. So the two graphs on, on the bottom of the slide are a visualization of a sample of, uh, of uh, Facebook uh, subgraphs. So the graph on the left represents a sample from the New Orleans region in Facebook uh, comprising roughly 60,000 uh, nodes uh, connected by roughly 800,000 edges. And we can see uh, uh, three interesting communities illustrated in the color red, yellow, and blue. There are some nodes in black that did not uh, fit neatly into, in, into any community, but their number was, was fairly small. Uh, the graph on the right is a subgraph of the graph on the left, where we only preserved an edge between two users on Facebook if that actually interacted with each other using, uh, say, wall post uh, uh, messages. So there are some in the social uh, networking field who believe uh, these types of relationships to be a stronger indication of trust uh, between users. Uh, and in this graph, we can, we can see that there are two, two interesting communities uh, illustrated in the color green, green and pink. So the challenge is to preserve, uh, you know, preserve these communities while uh, obfuscating, obfuscating the graph structure. Uh, I'd like to point out that in practice, uh, uh, a user can be part of multiple communities. So, so there, there, there are richer structures in, in these graphs than, than what I've illustrated so far. Uh, so to solve this problem, we, we introduced an approach uh, called uh, structured graph perturbation and in, uh, in a result in NDSS in 2013. And the key idea in this mechanism is to capture structural properties of social graphs uh, using the paradigm of random walks. Uh, so I'll illustrate this approach uh, and the algorithm via a simple uh, visualization. And the algorithm is, is extremely simple, uh, which allowed us to mathematically model uh, many of the properties of this, of this mechanism. Uh, so let's consider a particular starting vertex on this graph, say the vertex A. And uh, a random walk on a graph uh, samples a random neighbor of the starting vertex. Uh, so in this case, we sample the vertex C, and we continue this process and continue sampling uh, random neighbors. So here I'm illustrating a random walk of, of length three. And the idea in this algorithm is to uh, delete the first link in the random walk, which, is, which was the connection between A and C, and add a fake link between the starting point of the random walk and the terminus point of the random walk. So we're introducing a fake link between uh, A and E. Uh, so uh, the, the intuition in this algorithm is that let's, let's suppose I take the link that exists between me and Adam, I delete it to protect the privacy of this link, and then I sample uh, one of Adam's friends and say I connect to Brendan and I add uh, a link between me and Brendan. And the idea is that the kinds of uh, you know, recommendation, the kinds of reputation, the, kinds of, uh, uh, the kind of trust I might derive from having a relationship with Adam would be, uh, would be somewhat similar to having a relationship with Brendan. So for example, both are part of the, 
uh, part of the privacy community. Clearly, I'm adding some noise in the graph. Right? So the, uh, Adam is on the, uh, on the East Coast, Brendan is, is on the West Coast. So there's some, there's some noise in this process, uh, and that leads to the trade-off between, uh, between security and privacy. So one thing I'd like to point out is that we're adding quite a bit of noise in this mechanism because uh, with high probability, uh, no link in the obfuscated graph was a link in the original graph. I say this with high probability because there's some small chance that I do a random walk and I, uh, the walk terminates at a, at, a, at a node that was already a social contact. So here, the length of the random walk becomes a very interesting parameter to control this uh, trade-off between utility and, and privacy. Any question? Can you say more formally what you mean by privacy here? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll get to that. In particular, you said if, if almost no node in the final graph is, is one from the original graph, then if I know kind of your node and I exactly. see that there's not a... That, that, that leaks information, right? Information. And we have, to, we have to quantify that. Exactly, right. Uh, so the length of the random walk here becomes a very interesting parameter to trade off privacy and utility. So if I, uh, for example, do a one-hop random walk from Adam, that's really useful for utility, uh, but perhaps... Uh, uh, in, in the observed graph, by observing this connection between me and Brendan, an atta attacker could infer that I had a, a connection to, to Adam with, with some probability. Uh, so, of course, we can increase the length of the random walk. I can sample a two-hop or a three-hop or a six-hop uh, neighbor from, from Adam, uh, and I get increasingly stronger levels of privacy, uh, but, I, but I reduce the utility of the, of the obfuscated graph. Any, any questions about the algorithm so far? All right. So, uh, everything along the walk or just everything, period? Yeah, so let's focus on the first edge here between A, A to C. And we will replace this edge and, uh, with, the term, with the terminus point A of the random walk, E. But what about the other edges? And we repeat this process for all edges. So, so we, 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 each time I delete one edge and I add one edge. Right, I don't, I, I'm, I'm just asking, do you, I don't remove the other edges along that walk. Yes, but the important point right. here that I'd like to emphasize is that I'm always doing the random walks on the original graph where nothing is deleted. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm iteratively constructing this new graph. So when I focus on, say, a new edge here, I'm again performing random walks on the original graph where the edge between A and C still exists. Right. So uh, in terms of uh, a visual intuition for uh, the properties of this algorithm, here's the real Facebook subgraph that we are familiar with, which has these three interesting communities. And all of the other graphs that I will plot are synthetic graphs that were generated from this, uh, from this algorithm. Uh, the parameter t here governs the length of the random walk. Um, an interesting property of this visualization here is that if a vertex had a particular color, say blue in the original graph, we kept its color uh, the same uh, in the subsequent graphs. And this allows us to see how community structures are perturbed as we add more and more noise in the, uh, in the, in the, in the graph. Uh, so we can see here uh, visually uh, the degradation and the utility of the, uh, of the obfuscated graphs as a function of, uh, of the length of the random walk. Uh, and the interesting uh, points in the design space are the ones that correspond to a random walk with length uh, t equal to 5 and t equal to 10. Uh, so, so here we're adding a substantial amount of noise in the social graph. So uh, t equal to 5 represents a scenario where I'm doing a... Uh, a very long walk from, from Adam and, and replacing my link with Adam with, uh, with the terminus point of the, of the random graph. So we all know that we're roughly connected you know, uh, you know, in six hops on, a, on an average sense. And you know, some recent results from Facebook suggest that that average number might be closer to 4.7. Uh, 4 so this is, this is a substantial amount of noise. Uh, and yet we can see that the community structures in the, uh, in the graph are actually very, very well preserved uh, for, uh, well, more, more so for t equal to 5 than t equal to 10. Uh, while for larger values of, of uh, uh, the random walk length, we, we start to substantially lose uh, the utility of these graphs. So at some point, we converge to a graph that has lost all community structures. So that, that point is great for, for privacy, but not so useful for, uh, for real applications. Uh, so we observed a very similar phenomena for uh, the subgraph of the original graph, where we only have an edge if two users have interacted uh, via well post messages, and we see a very similar trend that for uh, random walks with length equal to five and 10, uh, the community structures are very well preserved, uh, but the communities start to, start to be perturbed more for higher values of the, of the random walk length. Uh, so this gives us a visual intuition that uh, this, this type of structured perturbation of data 
uh, can, can preserve utility while adding a very high level of noise. Jeremiah? Uh, is anything known about uh, you know, the spectral composition of the Facebook graphs, like how fast uh, random walks mix? Uh... Uh, yeah, so we, we've certainly uh, uh, performed an analysis of, uh, uh, of these types of algorithms in the context of large-scale social graphs. So we have results not for uh, the small-scale data set, but we have a result for a Google Plus data set. So we have a uh, we, we performed an initial crawl of Google Plus in 2012 uh, to capture around uh, 1 billion edges in the, in the social graph. And uh, our algorithms are, because of their simplicity of performing random walks, it's a really efficient operation. We are indeed able to scale to uh, uh, larger scale graphs. Uh, I suppose the mixing time depends upon uh, you know, some, some parameters, epsilon, that you, uh, that you care about. And I think uh, uh, values of 15 and 20 map well uh, to, to even, even the larger scale graphs. Going back to Brendan's question, while uh, this visual depiction gives us some intuition for the trade-off between privacy and utility, this really has to be quantified from a mathematical perspective. Right? How do we mathematically reason about the utility of obfuscated graphs? How do we mathematically reason about the privacy that these types of approaches are able to, uh, able to provide? Uh, I, I will skip the discussion of utility uh, in the interest of time, uh, but we have, uh, we have some mathematical results that connect the length of the random walk to the degradation in, uh, in the mixing time of the perturbed graphs with respect to the mixing time of the, uh, of the original, original graphs. And there's a very strong connection between mixing times and the, uh, and the utility of applications that rely on, on large, scale, uh, large scale graph characteristics. So I will move on to the question of uh, how do we reason about the privacy of, of these types of uh, mechanisms? Uh, and I'll first focus on an approach uh, where we consider a Bayesian perspective for analyzing privacy. Usually I apologize for the math in this slide, but I think for this audience, uh, this should be fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, the three key terms to, uh, uh, to understand, so let, uh, let G denote uh, the original graph, uh, G prime denotes uh, the obfuscated graph that the adversary gets to, gets to observe, and let H be any prior information that the adversary might have access to. Uh, now one way to phrase uh, and, and think about the privacy uh, of a particular link in the graph is, from a Bayesian perspective, is to compute the probability of the link existing in the original graph conditioned on the adversary having an access to the perturbed graph G and any other prior information H. And then we can use uh, Bayes' theorem to compute this probability as the probability of observing a particular graph G prime, this is the obfuscated graph, conditioned on L being a link in the original graph and the prior probability uh, or, and the prior information that the adversary has access to. There's some other terms in this, uh, uh, in this numerical compu computation, but those are not interested, as interesting in this, as this particular term. Uh, given the simplicity of the, of the random walk process, uh, we were able to characterize uh, this probability and compute an estimation of, uh, of uh, uh, probability of any, any link existing in the original graph. Uh, and then now we can, we can think about this as a, as a metric for, uh, for privacy. There are many variations on this metric that we can on also analyze. So for example, we can, uh, we can think about the, the entropy of this link uh, conditioned on the adversary's observation. Uh, and later on I will talk about uh, not just a static graph, but uh, a dynamic time series of graphs. And in those cases, we can also provide as adversary with uh, uh, time series information about obfuscated graphs. So this is an uh, example of uh, uh, a quantitative view of uh, the privacy offered by our approach from this Bayesian perspective. Uh, the x-axis here corresponds to uh, the link probability as computed by an adversary. Uh, this is in log scale and smaller values correspond to higher privacy. Uh, and this is a CDF. Uh, and we're plotting different lines here that correspond to different lengths of the random walk. Uh, so here we can see that uh, for very short random walks, if we, if we consider random walks of length t equal to two, uh, then we do not get uh, very high levels of privacy. So in fact, there are 30% of the cases where uh, an adversary is able to exactly reverse engineer uh, the original link based on the topological properties of the graph. But as we increase the length of the random walk, uh, we get substantially uh, higher levels of privacy. Again, we call that the x-axis here is in, uh, is, is in log scale. Uh, 
so for example, for a random walk length of t equal to five, which, uh, which preserved the community structures very, uh, community structures very, very nicely, uh, in, in more than 80% of, uh, of, of cases, the adversary's estimate of a link existing in the original graph was, uh, was less than point, uh, point 0 0.001. And of course, this value can be pushed substantially higher by choosing even, uh, even larger random walk lengths. The These are links were in the original graph. So you could also be inferring something about the fact that a link wasn't in the original graph. Indeed, graph. indeed, Abso absolutely. So there are many, many interesting cases to analyze here. Uh, uh, I, have, I have five minutes left, so in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll refer to you, uh, you to our, uh, our NDSS paper for, uh, for this discussion. Oh, yeah. Uh, good question. So uh, not all uh, links have the same uh, sensitivity. For example, like, uh, like uh, what is it, like the power reach links, like, if I'm connected to Bin Laden, this is like a sensitive information uh, uh, as opposed to I'm connected to my wife. Or yeah, absolutely. There's lo lots, of, lots of interesting challenges in this space that uh, uh, users might have a heterogeneous expectation of privacy across links, as Ilya pointed out, and uh, how to simultaneously satisfy those heterogeneous expe expectations of privacy uh, and think about rates, uh, even think about, think about rated graphs, uh, I think are interesting directions of, uh, of, of future work here. Are there simpler mechanisms that provide, uh, you know, similar guarantees? For, for example, you know, if you're adding and removing edges, you know, uniformly at random, then that will also preserve community structures. I mean, as certain certain types of community structures, right? It'll at least you can from them you can infer edge densities in the original graph for large enough sets of uh, vertices. So indeed, we, we, we looked at uh, some previous baselines that were based on uh, simple edge additions and edge, edge deletions, and, and we compared uh, both the privacy and the, and the utility properties of our approach with those baselines. Uh, so we achieved significantly higher levels of privacy, uh, because as I pointed out, with, uh, if, if we simply add a handful of edges and delete a handful of edges, then uh, in terms of the obfuscated graphs, an adversary can simply estimate those links to be existing in the original graph with, uh, with, with high, very high likelihood. Great. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the last few minutes that, that I have, I'll, uh, I'll make a case that uh, th this view of uh, structural properties of data has interesting consequences for, uh, for differentially private analysis as well. Uh, so there have been lots of exciting talks uh, in this workshop uh, focusing on uh, advanced differentially private mechanisms. Uh, there have also been uh, some discussion about relaxed variations of differential privacy. Uh, the view here is in the opposite direction in terms of thinking about stronger variations for differential privacy. Uh, so we've all seen uh, uh, a representation like this in, in, in previous slides, uh, which, which talk about this concept of neighboring database and differential privacy that typically differs by one data record. And uh, uh, in, in a very rough sense, differential privacy guarantees that the output distribution of data analytics does not change much if we change that, if we change that one data record. But if we think about the impact of, uh, of, uh, uh, of you know, structural properties of data, uh, it's important to again think about correlations that exist in different types of data. So whether it's uh, our, our friendship data sets, whether it's our communication records, uh, whether it's disease transmission, whether it's, uh, whether it's financial transactions, uh, the question is what is the impact of these types of correlations on, on, on the privacy properties of our, of our mechanisms? And uh, if, if you think about the definition of neighboring database that I showed in the previous uh, visualization, uh, that definition is not explicitly accounting for, uh, for correlations in, in data, uh, but correlations are pervasive in the data sets that we, uh, that we use. So there has been some previous work in the community focusing on stronger definitions than differential privacy that try to capture this phenomena, uh, including notions of uh, membership privacy by uh, Ningui Lee and his students at Purdue, uh, notions of uh, pufferfish, pufferfish privacy and bluefish privacy by Ashwin and, and his student uh, Xi, uh, notions of uh, inferential privacy. Uh, one open challenge for many of these stronger privacy guarantees is that it's not easy to come up with general mechanisms that achieve these privacy properties. Uh, so at the, at the high level, um, the paradigm that we introduced, is, uh, this was in a paper in NDSS in 2016, uh, it's called dependent differential privacy, where we are modifying uh, the definition of neighboring databases in, in, in differential privacy, uh, such that instead of just changing one record, uh, we're taking a broader view of the data set and thinking about the dependence and associative uh, uh, properties in this, in this data set, and also changing other records 
that might depend on that individual record. So think about uh, uh, the example of uh, a genomic data set where if you change the uh, genomic entry associated with uh, a user, you might also want to change uh, the genomic ent ent entities associated with the user's close relatives. Uh, so in this, in this fashion, we're able to account for uh, probabilistic uh, relationships between, uh, between user records uh, in, in, the, in the privacy formulation. The, the actual mathematical expression here is very, very similar to conventional uh, differential privacy, where uh, the probability of observing any output condition on these two uh, neighboring da databases does not, uh, does not differ much. So I, I, will leave you, uh, uh, I, will, I will leave you with this very high-level overview of, uh, of dependent differential privacy. There are lots of interesting challenges in terms of you know, how do we think about uh, these dependent, dependence relationships, how do we compute them, how do we design mechanisms that are able to uh, exploit knowledge of these uh, dependence relationships? Um, and how do they compare to previous, uh, previous baseline approaches? Uh, so one, one simple baseline approach that, that's immediately obvious is that uh, even conventional differential privacy approaches can provide dependent differential privacy guarantees using the group, uh, using the group uh, privacy properties of differential privacy. So if you have a mechanism uh, such as Laplace mechanism, and you set the epsilon values to be epsilon over L, where L is the number of dependent records here, then by the group privacy property, you will, you will uh, satisfy epsilon uh, dependent differential privacy. Though, though that particular mechanism may turn out to be uh, suboptimal. I'll, I will skip some discussion of uh, temporal dynamics and, and leave you with this key, uh, key takeaway that as we think about designing uh, the next generation of privacy preserving mechanisms, and as we think about uh, how to reason about uh, the privacy of those mechanisms, it's, it's important to consider uh, structural properties of data. It's important to consider how, how data evolves over time. Uh, I think I'm, I'm out of time. Happy to take any questions. We've got time for a few questions. I think, yeah, Ben. Okay. Um, so are, you're, are you familiar with the thing they did a few years ago on the Facebook social graph where they can predict the sexual orientation? I'm not. But Okay, well, it was, it was essentially by the edges they did it. So I, I was wondering if you had a chance to try running the same analysis on one of your conservative apps and see if it actually impacted the results at all. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a very interesting question. One can think about it from the perspective of utility. One can think about it from the perspective of privacy. Uh, so clearly for, for some applications, uh, the utility relies not in preserving the exact set of edges, but in, in terms of preserving more aggregate graph theoretic relationships on the graph, and certainly we're preserving the aggregate graph theoretic relationships, so that might be a positive from the perspective of utility. But from, from the perspective of privacy, uh, you could have some applications where those graph theoretic relationships reveal sensitive information, right? So for example, if we are not perturbing uh, a community with you know, a particular sexual preference, or a community with a particular ideology, then your membership in that community reveals some information about you. Uh, so we're not protecting users against those types of attacks. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned dependent differential privacy. Is, is it, um, it looks very similar to the sort of proper fish or an instance of the proper fish framework. We didn't get the whole definition, but uh, have the same ratio, you know, that, that odds ratio. Yep. So is it a special case? Of, uh, indeed, indeed. I think, uh, uh, and, and she, she can add, add to this if, uh, if I'm mistaken about this. So I think, indeed, Pufferfish is uh, an extremely general framework of privacy definitions, and most definitions can be cast as an instance of Pufferfish, including the dependent differential privacy uh, approach. I think the key, key point of departure is because of the generality of Pufferfish, it's extremely challenging to come up with, uh, with mechanisms that satisfy Pufferfish privacy. While at least for you know, some types of dependence relationships, we've been able to uh, come up with general privacy, def uh, privacy mechanisms for dependent differential privacy. Okay. So it's, it's, it's edges that contain the private information you preserve, yes. uh, that you're trying to preserve uh, or sensitivity of. But um, so you're, you're perfectly you're perfectly revealing the number of edges that somebody has. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think if our approach were to be used in a context where the privacy of the vertex was also important, then this question becomes very relevant because there's been some, there have been some attacks in the community uh, that have uncovered the identity of, of vertices purely based on the number of edges. Uh, 
so the focus of this work here was more on link privacy as opposed to vertex privacy. Uh, but, but right, I think uh, the approach I presented could potentially be augmented by randomizing uh, the, the number of edges. Uh, so, so, the, so the idea would be to add a higher number of edges than the actual number of edges in some cases and to delete more edges uh, than the actual node degrees. Right. <laughs> right. So I think so, such an augmentation should certainly be possible. It will be interesting to uh, see uh, the impact of that technique on uh, the overall utility of the system and the impact of that technique on, on the overall privacy. I think one advantage of the simpler uh, formulation that we studied here is that uh, in, in, in many cases it's, it's possible to mathematically model uh, this process and, and use that to analytically uh, think about privacy and analytically think about, uh, think about utility. Uh, Jeremiah? So, uh, you know, when you move from differential privacy to, um, uh, I guess, dependent uh, differential privacy, you're introducing some notion of prior, you know, of the attacker's belief, then that makes the definition, you know, harder for researchers to um, maybe interact with. Uh, you know, how would you suggest, uh, if we're going with uh, dependent differential privacy, how would you suggest, you know, modeling the prior, what are, um, yeah, that's a, what approaches have you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so let me just break it up into, into a couple of components. So, uh, so even though this line of work is, is proposing you know, generalized, stricter generalizations of differential privacy, perhaps it points to a key strength of differential privacy that uh, it is considering a simpler formulation where it doesn't have to worry about these types of priors. priors. So that's, that's a source of strength. Uh, I suppose it does introduce this challenge of uh, thinking about the consequences of this definition and the types of inference attacks that might be possible uh, in, 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 some, in some real world settings. Uh, so if you want a stronger grasp on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on uh, the connection between inference attacks and you know, what user expectations of privacy might correspond to, then these types of generalizations are helpful to think about, but they do, they do come with the challenge of how do we think about the dependence between, uh, between user records. And, uh, and here I think we might benefit from some connections uh, between uh, uh, between communities such as network science and data science that have uh, uh, been looking at this problem for, for a long time. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's 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 a good question. So the question is about uh, uh, is, is is thinking about this question that does this approach actually preserve the uh, the degree of uh, of a node in this in this obfuscated graph? Uh, so so we can think about this from two perspectives. One is the outgoing edges. So for each outgoing edge that you have, uh, and I didn't specifically talk about this approach from a directed or an under, undirected graph, but if you think about the outgoing edges, uh, then that part is clearly preserved because for each outgoing edge, there is a corresponding random walk for you. Uh, so the question is more about uh, you know, the incoming walks to a node. And it turns out that for undirected networks, we've been able to show using a very simple proof uh, that uh, the expected degree is preserved. But this, this is on an, on, a, on an expectation. So there is some, some variation in that process. Potentially, so, so indeed, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good comment that relates to the previous question. It's very easy to have an example of a graph where it will be preserved, right? You have one node in the middle and then links to three of them, right? So if you set up the directions right, then two of them can only wind up with an edge to one that only had one incoming and now have two incoming. Yeah, I think that there's some fun, fun corner cases here uh, that you know, some nodes could potentially even become undirect, uh, un disconnected from the rest of the graph. Uh, and I think a full algorithm takes care of those issues. So I refer you to the paper for, for more details. All right, so in the uh, interest of time, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. So let's thank uh, Pratik again.